Welcome to the Prospective Doctor Podcast, where we will provide essential information for pre-medical students and those already in medical school. Listen each week for tips on how to improve your application and gain an acceptance to medical school. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. This is Dr. Marinelli here, and you're listening to the Prospective Doctor Podcast. Right now, it's about the middle of July, and for those of you that are actively applying this cycle, you are definitely in full swing of the secondary season. So after you submit your primary application, it takes a few weeks, and then it gets verified by AMCAS, and then you start receiving secondary applications by medical schools that you apply to. We talked a few weeks ago about some tips to complete those secondary applications. But today I wanted to talk specifically about the CASPER test. So probably quite a few of you who've applied to several schools that require the CASPER test have been notified that you need to take this test. And I get tons of questions each year about the CASPER exam. What is it? How do I prepare for it? Which schools require it? So let's go over the CASPER test in detail and do a little bit of practice preparation as well. So the CASPER exam stands for Computer-Based Assessment for Sampling Personal Characteristics. So this is another tool that medical schools use to evaluate an applicant. So along with your MCAT, your GPA, your extracurricular activities, your personal statement, your written secondary application. The CASPER is another way for them to see if you have the decision-making capacity and critical thinking skills that are going to be required of you as a future physician. So the CASPER exam is an online exam that lasts a couple hours. It is 12 sections, and you're given either a short video or a short statement followed by three questions that you're required to answer. After you watch the video or read the statement, you are given about five minutes to write a written response to each one of those scenarios. So what is it really testing for? It's really testing about your personal qualities. And if you really possess empathy, compassion, if you can evaluate situations in an unbiased and objective manner, and really have moral and ethical decision-making capability. This is very reflective of how you'll be starting to think and required to think in medical school when you start seeing patients. You really have to be able to approach situations objectively and make decisions by critically thinking through all available material and information and then make an unbiased decision in regards to patient care. So the CASPER exam is really essentially testing you. Do you have that capability to be able to think like a medical student and then also incorporate those skills as a future physician? Similarly, when you start doing medical school interviews, like I talked about last week, you will have some interviews that are that are called multiple mini interviews or MMI interviews. The MMI interviews test similar characteristics as the Casper exam. Ethics, objectivity, critical thinking skills, but that's usually done in a kind of more intense dynamic situation where you're actually sitting down with an evaluator and they're critiquing you and asking you follow-up questions. Whereas the Casper exam asks you these similar principles, but on a more superficial level where it doesn't necessarily involve patient care. It can just be kind of like a situation that you can see every single day or maybe situations that you approach when you're studying with peers. They're still testing similar principles and concepts, but just in a more simplistic manner. The next question is which schools require the CASPER exam? There are several schools that require the CASPER exam. We do have a listing available on our website, so I won't list them all here. Certainly, this number is growing in the last few years. More and more schools are requiring the CASPER exam, but I will just state a couple of them that have become schools that are commonly applied to that are requiring it. And those, for example, are New York Medical College, Tulane, 
Central Michigan and Rosalind Franklin or Chicago Medical School. So some schools that applicants commonly apply to are now requiring this. So if you haven't gotten the notification that you need this exam for those schools yet, but you did apply there, you should start thinking about preparing for this test and taking it. The next question that I get very frequently is when should I take this test? So when you receive the email from the schools, look closely at their email and see if they have a deadline or a time they want you to take it. Most schools will not provide this information, but you can consider this as just part of the secondary application process. So in order for your application to move forward in its evaluation, you're going to need to have this test. So sometime in July is really the best time to take it. Try not to push it off too long because, again, in order for your application to move forward and be more evaluated, you'll need to have this test. So let's talk about next, how can you prepare for the CASPER exam? So with the CASPER exam and the MMI interviews that I discussed earlier, The key here is practice, practice, practice. Read lots of scenarios. Use all the available CASPER test material to test yourself. And also, I recommend trying to sit down and maybe do a couple time scenarios. So get a prompt or a video, watch the video, see the three questions, and then practice typing out those responses and see if you're able to write them quick enough and have that practice. You can also read about medical ethics and ethical decision-making. I don't suggest spending a ton of time on this. I think this is more important for when you're preparing for your MMI interviews rather than the CASPERS to read about medical ethics. Instead, you can kind of just do an overview. And I think the key here is just trying to practice as many scenarios as you possibly can. So let's go through a sample CASPER question and see how we could possibly answer this question. So one of the sample Casper questions that's on their website is consider this statement. From time to time, we deal with conflict in some form. And then there's three questions that follow this. Number one, describe a time when you had to deal with conflict and how you coped with it. So this should be a pretty short, straightforward example Pick something that was a significant conflict and that you handled it positively. Obviously, you don't want to pick an example where you conflicted with somebody or a group and then it had a negative outcome. For example, I might write about how when I was in my research lab as an undergrad, I was working with another student and her and I conflicted about how a certain experiment should be ran. I really wanted to perform it in one day so I could get the results that same day, but she really wanted to perform it in two days because she had some time constraints and wasn't able to complete it and spend the necessary time that day. So in order to resolve the situation, I compromised and completed the majority of the experiment one day and then followed with her the next day to finalize it and complete the rest of it. It's a pretty simplistic explanation, but it's a way that it shows the greater that you actually have had conflict. You are able to think through it and try to find a solution that works with for you and whoever you've conflicted with and that you were able to solve the situation in a positive note. Let's look at question number two. How might you handle a similar situation differently should it arise again. So this is just kind of thinking through using hindsight. Is there even a better way to solve this problem? So looking back on this situation, maybe I would have split the responsibilities so we could complete the experiment that worked with our individual time frames. And then I could go on and say why I thought that this may be the most effective way possible. So for instance, I could discuss how since we were all under different time constraints and we all had different responsibilities outside of the lab, if I would have split the responsibilities with my partner, then we would have been able to come to the same results, but make it a little bit more conducive and easier on each other's schedules. 
Number three, what would be your strategy if you were faced with a conflict that was extremely difficult to resolve? So this is a very, very general question, but basically, again, they're kind of looking for your problem-solving skills and your critical thinking skills and also your compassion. So when you're having a conflict, it's going to be with somebody else or another team. So are you compassionate enough to work with them and try to resolve the conflict so that it will benefit you and that person or the team that you're working with and not only benefit yourself? So perhaps you could write something to the effect of, If I was faced with an extremely difficult conflict, I would approach the team members or the individuals that I am working with and discuss different strategies in order to resolve the conflict. We would try to do this in a timely manner so that we could resolve it, but also taking into account each person's individual preference and abilities. Once we are able to discuss the different strategies, we would try to come to a consensus where we all agreed and we all benefited from that specific strategy and it worked for everyone as much as possible in order to get the task completed. So this is just, again, illustrating that you have the ability to critically think through a situation and solve a problem should it come up. Let's go through one other Casper scenario. So in this scenario, you can watch the video online. Basically, it's about a 45-second video where it shows that you're a cashier. A woman comes in to return a stuffed animal that she bought at this store, but she doesn't have the receipt. You offer her store credit, but the woman is refusing store credit and says she absolutely needs the cash. And you're an employee, and you kind of look to another employee who is supposed to be you kind of wondering, what should I do in this situation? So the first question here is, what do you tell the other employee? Go ahead and give the refund or abide by store policy. Justify your answer. So this is kind of where it's testing your own personal characteristics. Some people may say, I would go ahead and give her the refund because I can understand that she needs the cash and that as a store employee, I can make that call and provide that for her. However, I think the more correct answer and probably the more ethical slash moral answer would be to abide by store policy. And you justify this by saying, although I can very much understand this woman's situation and I would like to help her as much as possible, I am a store employee and therefore I abide by all the store's policies and I would continue to do so. So here you're really demonstrating that you have compassion and empathy because you're stating that you understand the woman's situation, but you are having integrity. You're showing them that you would honor what the store and what your job entails by only offering her store credit. Number two, assume you advise the newer employee not to give the refund, but she does anyway. Do you report this to your supervisor? Why or why not? This is a really common type question, kind of where you see somebody doing something wrong, and then you have to decide, should I take this to a higher authority or do I just keep it to myself? The most correct answer in any of these situations is to do something about it. Which one you choose will depend on the situation. If I were to answer this question, I would try to answer it something to this effect. First, I would go and talk to that employee and say that I do not think that that was the correct thing to do and it was not, it did not follow store policy. I would encourage her to tell the supervisor herself. If the employee absolutely disagrees and does not want to go forth to the supervisor, then I would report the behavior to the supervisor myself. If she seems reasonable and understands that, yes, this was a mistake, I should not have done it, then in that case, I do not think I would report this to the supervisor. But the concept here being tested regardless of how you answer it, is again, just trying to make sure you're doing the right thing. And if you see somebody else doing the wrong thing, making sure that you bring it to someone's attention. The parallel in medicine I see with this type of concept is if you were a physician and you saw another physician who came to work drunk or in bad shape, 
would you report it to somebody else? And if you think about it in that sense, obviously you would try to do something. You would either go talk to that physician or you would report that physician immediately because it could so significantly impact patient care. So if you think of it in those terms, I think it kind of helps you answer those questions a little bit easier. Final questions here. Number three, if you were asked to establish a policy for a new store around refunds, what aspects would you take into consideration? Another kind of general question here, but I don't think this one is testing your ethical ability or empathetic abilities here, but more of your decision-making abilities and your ability to think through multiple different factors. So you could say something to the effect of, I would consider looking at past data to see what were most refunds. Were they refunds, returns, store credits? How many receipts were received? How many receipts weren't? I would also consider making it easier on the customer if they had forgotten a receipt by maybe taking an email and linking it to an email or having digital copies of receipts so that if a customer didn't have a receipt, we could work with them more easily by offering them a full refund if they did not have the physical copy of the receipt. So again, just kind of thinking through different scenarios here and coming up with potential solutions. So that is a little bit about the Casper exam. Hopefully that kind of helped get the ball rolling on preparing for this exam and giving you some thought into how you should go about answering these questions definitely check out Perspective Doctor. We have tons of blogs and different information on the Casper exam. And let us know if you have any questions. Talk to you guys next week. Our mission is to inspire, encourage, and inform students as you journey through a rigorous and intricate process of achieving your dreams in medicine. Visit us at ProspectiveDoctor.com for more essential resources in your medical school journey.